Okay, we wrap up topic number two with the analysis of merge sort. Analysis of merge sort gives us the opportunity to illustrate some things we learned in the insertion sort analysis, and also we're going to learn a new technique. With insertion sort, we found that we didn't have to keep track of constant time. Remember all those C1s plus C2 plus, plus C whatever, 8, and it all turned out to be just equal to some constant. Why keep track of them? And we also found out that we only need to be concerned with the portions of the code whose execution time grows the fastest with the input size, the dominating terms. So n squared is a faster growing term than uh, n, so why bother counting the n's when the n squared is going to dominate? We will express this dominating growth rate using the theta notation. So, for example, insertion sort's best case was theta of n, meaning the time gets bigger as a linear function of n when the input gets bigger. And its worst case is theta of n squared, meaning it's a quadratic growth as the data gets bigger, the time grows as in proportion to n squared. We will be more precise about these ideas in next week's topic. So while insertion sort's runtime depended on the data, as it turns out, the runtime for merge sort is the same for any data. We're going to analyze it in two parts. Uh, the merge procedure is easier to analyze, so we'll do that first. It'll illustrate how, what we learned about how we can do analysis more simply by doing that excessively tedious analysis of insertion sort. And then we'll get on to merge sort, which will require that we use a new analysis technique that goes with the divide and conquer. So let's begin with the easier merge procedure. Okay, here is the merge procedure, and our task is to identify how the runtime of this procedure grows as the input size grows. So what's the input size? Well, initially merge is called with p equals 1 and r is n, the end of the array. q is, of course, telling us where it's divided into half. These two lines here take some constant time. And, of course, we know now that we shouldn't bother keeping track of those things. Array allocation, well, that will take some certain amount of time as well. but Let's look at the loops here that will actually iterate over some of the data size here. So this loop iterates from 1 to n1. This goes from 1 to n2. But we know that those two numbers represent the two halves of the array. So taken together, lines 4 through 7 are going to take theta of n time to run. In other words, the amount of time that this takes to run will grow in proportion to the growth of n. Next, we have two more assignment statements. Uh, these are just some other constant. And, uh, well, these assignments as well are just some other constant. So we need to ask about the growth rate of this loop. Uh, this loop will also iterate, actually, over n items because it's comparing the two arrays, each of which are about half of the data, and stepping through them together until it uh, has picked off all the elements. So this one is also theta of n. So, so we have our conclusion. The whole thing is, is theta of n. And notice that we reached this conclusion in what could have been done in about 60 seconds. And the highly mathematical analysis of the insertion sort took quite a bit of time. But now that we know that we don't have to keep track of all the details and write all of these expressions, we can just look quickly at some code. Well, not too quickly, but carefully to say, oh, well, this ranges through half of the n items, and this ranges through the other half, and this also ranges through all the n items. So we know that overall this thing is theta of n. So now let's move on to the merge sort itself. Here now is the merge sort, the master procedure. Let's first write down what we already know. We know that this just takes one step to do the comparison. We're going to say that that grows at the same rate as the function 1, because 1 doesn't grow. It's a constant. It stays the same. Similarly, we're going to look at line 2 here, and we're going to say, well, there's more steps than in line 1, so it takes longer than in line 1, but it's still a constant. It doesn't grow. So we're going to say that this also takes theta of 1 time. The growth rate of the, this time that this takes as n gets bigger is constant. It doesn't grow. The analysis we just did shows that merge takes theta of n. And again, n is expressed by setting p equals 1 and r equal n on the first call. So that will be theta of n to merge. But what do we do about these two, term, these two lines? We're trying to figure out what the runtime of merge sort is. So we need the answer to answer the question. It's circular. 
how do we answer the runtime of merge sort if answering it requires knowing the runtime of merge sort? This is the classic problem of analyzing recursion, particular in the divide and conquer paradigm. Divide and conquer is often solved analytically using uh, what are called recurrence relations. And we'll write the recurrence relation in a minute, but I want to first consider the parts of a divide and conquer strategy to build up what we're going to write the recurrence relation with. Okay, so divide and conquer eventually really reaches a small problem size that's so small that it's easy to uh, solve immediately. And we're going to call this the base case when it's a, a very little problem. And typically this will cost um, theta of 1. Not always. There, it's possible to use a non-constant runtime algorithm, but this is the typical case, such as, for example, when we reach a, a list of size 1 in a sort algorithm and we don't have to do anything to sort it. Okay, if we don't have uh, the base case, then we need to divide the problem up into subproblems, solve the subproblems, and combine them. So let's start with uh, divide. How long does it take to divide a problem up of size n? Well, in general, we don't know. We're just going to write a term out for this. We're going to say it costs uh, d of n, and we'll figure out what it is for each particular case. Then we want to know what does it cost to solve the subproblems, the conquer. And this is where we run into the problem mentioned above. The cost to solve the subproblem is similar to the cost we're trying to figure out overall. So what we do here is a strategy I've already mentioned in analysis. If we don't know what, to, uh, what something is, we just give it a name. So we're going to observe that in general, when we're solving a uh, divide and conquer problem, we might take the problem of original size, we might divide it up into A subproblems, and each of them might be of size, well, they might be 1 over B size of original, which at first will be N, but of course then of smaller problems. Then we're going to write out an expression that says the, the cost to solve the conquer portion is A, because we have A subproblems times whatever the time is to solve subproblems of size n over b. So we got this because, first of all, we're we don't know the time, so we're just giving it a name. We'll figure it out later. So this is the time to solve the problem of the size that we've broken it down into times the number of those problems we have to solve. Now, I'm going to just note that often a equals b equals 2, which will be the case for merge sort. Often, but not always, we divide the problem into half and we solve two halves. A is two for the two halves and E is two for dividing it in half. Finally, we have to combine. Put them all back together, such as in the merge sort, that is the merge operation. And we'll write, in general, the term will be, it's some function C of n. We happen to know for the merge sort, the, the, the combining is merge and it's theta of n. But this function could be some other other function of n and other algorithms. So this gives us the parts needed to write recurrence relations that are used to do analysis of divide and conquer problems. So I will now write up here the general recurrence relation which we're then going to modify for this particular um, algorithm. So the time to solve the problem as a whole is going to be theta of 1 if we're in the base case. So uh, the base case means the size of the problem is below some constant. In this particular case, it would be below 2 when we get to an array of 1 to be sorted. Otherwise, we're going to have to solve this A subproblems of T n over B cost each. So it's going to cost A T n over B. And we've got to pay the cost to divide them. And we've got to pay the cost to combine them. Okay, that is the general schema for doing analysis of divide and conquer type algorithms using recurrence relations. And now we will plug this, plug in what we know about the merge sort to solve this for merge sort. Okay, and it turns out that this is fairly straightforward. The cost to solve the base case, we already know with merge sort, is theta of 1. Now, what's A and what's B? Well, with merge sort, we take the problem of size n and we divide it in half and we solve two of them. So I'm going to erase the general variables in here, put in the fact that we're solving two problems of size n over 2. 
Now, what about the D in the end? Well, the cost to divide is this stuff up here. That's the base case. This is the cost to divide. It's constant time. So I could erase this and write theta of 1, the cost to divide. But then we go look at the cost to combine. That's the merge, which is theta of n. So let's turn this into theta of n. And one of the rules we're going to learn, uh, of course, that we've already discussed intuitively, is that the growth of this dominates this. So we, should, we don't even need to have that term in there, because that's, that's another constant. We should just write theta of n for this whole thing. So let me just erase all that stuff there. We will revisit that point um, in part 3. But this, is, this expression covers the cost to do all the dividing and combining, because we know it's dominated by the largest term for combining. So that is the recurrence relation for merge sort. And we will next look at how we solve this recurrence relation to get an actual theta for the overall t thing here. OK, I've cleaned things up here a bit. Uh, there's one thing I forgot to do. With the uh, merge sort, we know that we hit the base case when n is equal to 1. Now we want to solve this for merge sort. First, we need to uh, change these thetas into something we can do math on. The thetas express growth rate, uh, but we need to change them into uh, expressions that we can manipulate algebraically. And you're going to have to study your textbook to understand when it's OK to do what I'm about to do. But I'm going to choose a constant c that is the largest constant in, the whole, in, in all the mathematics here. It's big enough that I can say that this will be replaced with c. And this expression here, some function that grows in proportion to n, can also be expressed as cn. And you can see that, of course, cn also grows in, linearly in proportion to n. We're just using c to represent whatever constants were hidden in that, in that theta growth rate. So merge sort cost c if n is 1 and cost 2t n over 2 plus some constant n otherwise. And now we need to figure out how to turn this into a closed form equation where we don't have the same variable on both sides. We want to just say t of n is equal to something specific. In, when we cover chapter 4, we'll cover three methods for doing this. There's recursion trees, substitution, and the master theorem. The master theorem gives the answer with a straightforward calculation. Uh, here we're going to do it a little bit more informally using recursion trees uh, to illustrate the idea of this kind of analysis. So let's look at the cost it takes to handle the original problem of size n. We give this an array of size n, and what do we have to do? Well, we have to divide it up, and we're going to also have to merge it. So the d and the c, remember the divide and the combine, are now expressed by this, this expression cn. So let's just write that here. Let's say cn is the cost uh, to do the initial dividing up and then combining. But having divided the problem up, of course, we have to solve two subproblems. There's two subproblems, so that's why I drew two lines here. Be careful when you do these things. It's not always two lines. It can be one line sometimes. It can be three lines. You've got to know what A is to know how many of these lines to draw. And then each subproblem costs this. So let's just write that there. And again, when you do other problems like this, don't just write N2 there without thinking. Make sure you know what B is, and what's the size of the subproblems it's broken into. So now we have two subproblems, and we can apply the same recurrence relation to each of these. But now we're essentially plugging n over 2 is going to be wherever n appears here. And so the same thing will happen. Solving this problem, we have input of size n over 2. So just like we wrote cn up here, we're going to write cn over 2 here. again over here. And of course, each of these subproblems is solved by breaking them down into two ha further halves. And so we have to pay the cost t of n over 4, because now these are smaller. OK, so you see how you saw how the merge sort breaks things into half and keeps breaking things into half until it gets into tiny problems. It solves those problems, and then the, the solution's coming back up. Uh, this tree represents that recursion tree. 
you know, when you get the solutions done to these two sublists, you're going to pay C and over two costs to merge them. You know, this, this expression here represents the cost it took to divide them as well as the cost it took to merge them. And so this actually continues. So the cost to handle these four subproblems of size n over 4 has its own subtree, which is rooted by a term c n over 4, just like it was c of n, c of n over 2. These are going to be c n over 4. And then it will continue on down. Let me go ahead and do that. OK, so this 1 quarter size problem is going to cost c n over 4. OK, so there I've written out all the subproblems of what they cost. And this all continues. Each of these now is broken down into half. And eventually, it's all got to bottom out somewhere. When do you stop dividing things in half? Well, we have the answer right here. When we stop dividing things in half, uh, it'll be when the subproblem has reached size of 1. So when the subproblem has reached size of 1, we stop using this term and we use this term. We, we pay a cost of c. So all of these leaves will have c at the end. Now this recursion tree is a capturing the recursive call structure. The first call, it does two calls, each of those does two calls, and so on. So the total cost to run the algorithm is the sum of all these expressions in this tree. How the heck do we add up all those things? Well, let's notice something here. Let's sum the values in the rows. If you sum the values in the rows of this tree, this one here sums the cn. This is cn over 2 plus cn over 2. That sums the cn. cn over 4 summed 4 times sums the cn. c summed n times sums cn. So each row of this diagram gives us cn costs contribute to the total cost of the runtime of merge sort. So if you think of the this column of numbers here, it's essentially expressing how wide the tree is in terms of cost. And if we make a rough analogy to calculating the area of a rectangle, of course you compute width times height. So if we know that the width is cn, we just need to know the height. How many, in other words, how many of these rows are there? And then we will have the answer. And this is where we use the fact that the problem is divided in half. Now, the problem input size may be something other than a power of 2, which makes the arithmetic a little inconvenient. But if we're just trying to get a rough idea of the growth, we can say, well, given any input size, let's just round it up to the next power of 2, and we'll assume that the input size, n, is a power of 2. And so 2 keeps getting divided in half until it becomes size 1. And so then we have the question, how many times can you divide a number in half, particularly a power of 2, before you get to 1? Well, that is precisely the log of n, the log base 2 of n, because that is the definition of, of logs. You know, n is equal to 2 to the log of n. That's the definition of the log base 2 of n is the number that to which you raise 2 to that power, you get n. So, for example, if this initial n was 1024, 2 to the 10, you can only divide it in half 10 times until you get to items of size 1 here. So there's going to be exactly log n levels below this root level. We can only divide this in half log n times. So the overall total is going to be that there are log n plus 1 for this level here of these c of n's. So if we multiply that out, we get c n log n plus c n. Now again, let's ask what's the dominating term here. The c's don't really matter. When we go to theta notation, we ignore the c. We're just looking at growth rate. But we know that that grows as n gets bigger. But this n grows at the same rate, and any uh, input sizes we're going to be dealing with, this will also grow. And so this whole term grows faster than that term. So this is the dominating term. So the answer we are seeking is that this whole thing 
grows proportionally to n log n. And that is, in fact, a typical growth rate for an efficient sort. Remember, the selection sort was best case theta of n and worst case theta of n squared. n squared grows faster than this. So a merge sort, in large cases, is more efficient than a selection sort, unless the data is sorted. A selection sort is going to be much faster if the data is sorted. OK, I need to make a correction. I just realized I've been saying selection sort when I meant insertion sort. Well, that is the end of part two. I hope this gave you an idea of different methods of analysis and prepares you well for the rest of the course.